this looks more like a steady circle than a talk which is better sri aurobindo is unique as all of us know he is one of the greatest explorers of consciousness he is sarvatantra swatantra acharya as kapalishakti puts it today's topic adventure sri aurobindo on the adventure of consciousness is kind of an extremely important topic it, it in, encompasses the entire gamut of sri aurobindo's philosophy to us but in simple terms what do we understand by adventure of consciousness adventure of consciousness is our spiritual journey adventure of consciousness is our journey into the realms of consciousness adventure of journey is our spiritual journey from asatoma to satgamaya tamasoma to jyotirgamaya mrutyorma to anuttangamaya from mortality to immortality it is our spiritual journey from matter to spirit and she or in those words it is our spiritual journey from the least known to the vast unknown it is our spiritual journey in its essence it is our spiritual journey as part of our being a part of the entire evolutionary process as she or so this whole thing the entire journey probably not only this life lives in the past and in the future to come is the adventure of consciousness for sri aurobindo it was an adventure of consciousness because he experienced it for us also it is a adventure of consciousness here because we aim to go there we aim to reach there so this in a sense is the title of the topic adventure of consciousness so it is in one term in one single sentence it is our <clears throat> spiritual journey now before we actually go into the topic of adventure of consciousness it is extremely important for us to understand what consciousness is what exactly is consciousness how do we define consciousness consciousness if we look into the dictionary meaning was from the western point of view to try to understand it says they are just a kind of general awareness i am aware of this i am aware of my surroundings i am aware of you i am aware of this and this happening that happening ultimately in general it becomes a general awareness what consciousness is as far as the dictionary is concerned and if you take western understanding of what consciousness is it's the conundrum it is even now it is considered as one of the hard problems for science for science when somebody says that it is a hard problem that means it has not been possible for us to find any solution to this so hence it becomes a hard problem and hence the conundrum what exactly is the consciousness conundrum whether consciousness arises out of brain as per western science or all the brain activities arise because of consciousness this is the consciousness conundrum but when we come to about consciousness consciousness actually appears to us in two states one is the cosmic or the universal consciousness which actually is omnipotent omnipresent omniscient nirakara nirguna it is absolutely eternal it is immutable it is not subject to any modifications and the source of this cosmic consciousness this universal consciousness this pure consciousness is brahman itself this is the original source now the second state of consciousness is the individualizing consciousness that is my consciousness your consciousness that is the individualized consciousness this individualized consciousness is subjected to modification is subjected to change is subjected to dualities and the origin of the source of this individualized consciousness is the prakriti itself because it is the nature which is dynamic in its 
essence in its expression, then it becomes, that's why the individualized consciousness becomes dynamic. That's why we have different states of consciousness, each individual is different, each individual is unique and other things. But when it comes in terms of Sri Aurobindo, what consciousness is, he refers to this pure consciousness, and that is what that pure consciousness is in the phase adventure of consciousness. As far as Sri Aurobindo is concerned, it is this consciousness, he says, it is the Alpha, the Omega. Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letters of the Greek alphabets. In Christianity, because Sri Aurobindo was actually influenced greatly in his early days by Christianity, he refers to this. In Christianity, usually this Alpha and Omega are as the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. He is taken to indicate the comprehensiveness of the divine himself. That's why he says, the, uh, he is the Alpha, he is the Omega. He is everything. Without him, nothing moves. You know, he is, he is the Isha of Isha Vasudevan Sattva. He is the essence of Tenavina Pranamati Nurture. You know, without you, not even a blade of grass comes into the picture. It is this consciousness when it diffuses itself without losing its intensity, it becomes macrocosm. It is this consciousness which condenses itself, concentrates itself without losing its intensity. It becomes microcosm. And this microcosm and the microcosm is definitely because of this consciousness. And he says this consciousness is just not power. It is not the power of understanding, the power of awareness, but it is actually a creative power which is capable of creation. So this is chit shakti and it is just not chit. So hence you are in the concept of consciousness force and not consciousness. So here, what, what becomes important here is the consciousness itself is the the primary substance of everything. We call this consciousness by several names. Sri Aurobindo refers to it as, yes, we know it as the God, the Absolute, the, the Supreme, the Asatamic Truth, the Ultimate, the Ultimate Reality, and several names we give it. But in, in, in its essence, it is the one, it is this pure consciousness, it is this true consciousness, it is this supramental consciousness, what we are talking about. It is the same consciousness in some religion it becomes Abraham, in some religion it becomes Ibrahim, and in Vedanta it becomes Brahman. It is the same, same consciousness. Now, when we come to the faith, I think let us, we can go on talking about the consciousness for days together because Shri Aparshi or Rabindo it is the consciousness is nothing but the entire life itself is nothing but the evolution of consciousness itself. But let us come to this today's uh, topic, adventure of consciousness, which is a spiritual journey. Now, even if we in our mundane life, forget about our spiritual journey, even in our ordinary journey, suppose we want to make a trip to some pilgrimage or visit some place, what do we do? What do we plan? How do we plan? There are two and three important things are there in us, even in our regular journey. What is the first three things important? We should know our starting point, right? When we take up a journey, we should know what is our starting point. We should know what exactly is our destination, that is the end point. And thirdly, it would be very apt for us if we have a guide with us. When, because we are traveling into those terrains which are not known to us. And when we travel in those terrains which are not known to us, we need a guide. So these three important points, when we for, for our journey to be effective, even for our ordinary tour in our mundane life to be effective, the awareness about the starting point, the awareness about the end point, that is the destination, and the guide who can help us 
that oh look on your way this 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 is a good place on your way this is the one so the whole journey becomes extremely effective and joyful so you need these three things and the same thing applies for our spiritual journey too now how do we take up this journey where do we start in our spiritual journey what is the starting point in our spiritual journey what is the end point in our spiritual journey who is the guide these are the questions which actually come to us reminded of two lines in savitri which give us this indication the unfelt self within who is our guide the un un unknown self above who is our goal these are the two beautiful indications isn't it in our spiritual journey sri arvind gives us the un unfelt self within who is the guide so that means he has told us who is the guide and he has told us where is the starting point no the unknown god above who is the goal that means he has told us the destination also now so this is our spiritual journey from the self who is within who is also the guide and then our goal the god the unknown god who is above is the destination but how do we actually take this journey these are the two guidelines given to us by sri aurobindo in sanskrit now what is the next question next question is who is this self we know the starting point is deep within we know that my self is my guide i know what is my destination but who is this self who is this true self of mine who is who, who is that the whole upanishads all upanishads in fact give us this indication especially the kenu upanishad it starts from the question itself kena ishitam kena ishitam patati preshit preshitam manaha that is who is that by who by what who is that motivator who inspires who guides who directs the mind to focus on its object who is this sri aurobindo calls him as mind of minds what exactly is this mind of minds so who is this self this is the kena upanishad which talks entirely of addresses our today's topic who is this self and once we understand who exactly is the self now how do we approach him how do we understand that self within him unless we know the starting point unless i know my guide how the spiritual journey is possible it is not possible so i should find out what my self is in taittiriya upanishad there is a beautiful definition which we are all aware this taittiriya upanishad comprises of several shlokas but for this one dialogue it is always in all upanishads it's a dialogue between the guru and the shishya the shishya asks the question the guru answers and finally finds a solution now similar dialogue is happens who the self is in taittiriya upanishad this this dialogue comes between bhrigu and his father varuna and hence this is what, that is why the the varuna the vidya imparted by varuna to bhrigu this is known as varuni vidya taittiriya upanishad now what is this knowledge imparted by the guru now bhrigu comes to his father and then he says who is this self who am i how do i understand how do i understand this pure consciousness how do i what is the relation between my true self and then that self who is above then the varuna the guru who is the father of bhrigu himself he says try to go and understand anna that is the first kosha the first loka annamaya loka or the annamaya kosha for see remember these things sri aurobindo makes it absolutely clear that this universe is made up of infinite numbers of planes of consciousness 
Okay. Now, each plane of consciousness is a world by itself. And each world of this, each plane of consciousness has its own governing deity. It has got its own God. For example, Annamaya Loka at the cosmic level corresponds to Annamaya Kosha in an individual case. And the deity governing the two Lokas, the Annamaya Loka, Annamaya Kosha is the Annamaya Purusha. Similarly, there is a Pranamaya Loka, then Pranamaya Kosha, and then Pranamaya Purusha. So several layers and layers. And when the universe is formed of infinite numbers of planes of consciousness, the corresponding infinite planes of consciousness exist in the individual. So that is why all the universal forces, all the communication that comes to an individual through the universal lokas intercept what is called as envelope, nervous envelope of our human being and then enter the individual consciousness at the corresponding level. You know, this in general is to be understood. So let us come back. So he, the father says, Varuna says, go and understand the Annamaya Loka, the, this Annamaya Purusha. And the Prabhu goes, understands the, the, the penance, tapasya, and then comes back with the realization, oh yes, this is true. Annamaya Loka, Annamaya Purusha is the Brahman itself. Why? Because from, from the matter, from the earth, from the soil, all the plants come out, from the plants come the herbs and so on. And from them, the food gets generated, that it is the food what we eat. And because we eat the food, we survive, we live. And then we go back into the earth. So, Annamaya Purusha is the Brahman. So, he comes back to his father and then he says, Annam Brahmeti Vajanat. What does it mean? Annam Brahmeti Vajanat. He comes and, oh, father, I have understood Annamaya Purusha is Brahman. But I am not satisfied. I cannot be only Annamaya Purusha. And then father says, Anyotara Atma Pranamaya. That means the soul of Annamaya Purusha is in Pranamaya Purusha. Go and try to understand it. Bhrugu again goes back and then he comes back. And then he says, I have understood Pranamaya Purusha as the only Brahman. He encompasses the Annamaya Purusha, Annamaya Loka, but still I am not happy. Why Pranamaya Purusha? Because the Pranamaya, it is there, the Pranamaya is there, the life energy comes into the picture, the whole Prana gets converted, the life energy, my desires, my ambitions, everything arises out of there. So that becomes important. When he is not satisfied, then he comes, Anyontara Atma Manomaya. He says, the soul of Pranamaya is in Manomaya. Try to go and understand Manomaya Purusha as Brahman. Then Bhagu again goes back, comes back. He says, not satisfied. Then he repeats Anyontar Atma Vidyanamaya. He goes back and then he comes back. And then he says, An Vidyanam Adam Heti Vajana. Vidyana Adam Heti Vajana. I have understood the Vidyana Purusha, but still. It is important here for us to note, it's only in our ancient Hindu scriptures, we differentiate between the mind and the intellect. That is the Manomaya, Manomaya Loka and then the Vidyana Maya Loka. In Western theology, these are all lumped together in one common you know, entity as mind itself. They don't understand. The intellect, the Vidyana Maya is the one which gives us the ability for the reason, for the analytical capability, for the logic, for reason, everything, the entire buddhi, viveka. You know, there are no equivalent terms in English, unfortunately, for these Sanskrit words. So when these comes into the picture, they are not able to differentiate. So that's why they put lump all together in one, this thing called mind. So now here, this man, the Brahu comes and then understands the finally he goes, you know, Anyantara Atma Anandamayana, 
then he goes into that and then he comes back, he realizes who the Anandamaya Purusha is. And it is this Anandamaya Purusha, in a sense, who is the delight himself. Nothing but sheer delight. Nothing but, we all exist only because of happiness, isn't it? Every existence, every, every speck of dust, it exists because of some happiness, some kind of fulfillment. An atom has got probably some kind of fulfillment. It wants to become a molecule of something, gets joined to something, become a molecule. My happiness, I have a fulfillment. I, and we get involved in achieving, acquiring those happinesses that we don't mind suffering for getting that happiness. And we call him themselves when we say that we need to sacrifice something to gain something. This common thing. And what is that sacrifice? That means we are ready to even to undergo any kind of suffering to see that we fulfill our requirement. We attain happiness. Now, when this this is the case, so you know, in, 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 Sri Aurobindo again says it so beautifully analyzes. So we are actually siddhas in the outside world. I have nothing, nothing to uh, achieve in the outside world. I, I, I'm so used to it. I know what is happiness. I know to, how, what, what to do. Every human being, we're all nothing to do. So there is no sadhana left in the outside world. There is nothing to do, no sadhana to do. A sad, so he cannot be called as a sadhak itself if he keeps looking at outside and then outwardly looks and then only talks about it superficially. There is no sadhana in Unless the sadhak looks into it, the only thing where it comes is the insight. So anyway, let us come back to this five koshas as told by Varuna to Bhrugu. And these things, the, the Annamaya Loka or the Annamaya Kosha becomes the foolish sharira, which is the gross body. The remaining three, Pranamaya Kosha, Manomaya and Vijnanamaya, they become the subtle bodies. That is Sukshma Deha. And then the final, the uh, Anandamaya Purusha becomes the causal body, which is the Karana Sharira. So now, once we come to the understanding of this uh, true self of the inner, please remember, we are still at the starting point of our spiritual journey. We have just trying to understand whatever true self is, which is required to start to begin our journey. Now, this journey and as a part of, and Sri Aurobindo calls this as the psychic thing. The inner Purusha, the inner, our true self is my psychic being, which actually takes, let us not get into what Sri Aurobindo talks about, central being, psychic being, but this is the soul, the psychic being in simple terms. The psychic beings which actually takes part in the evolutionary process. There is a witness soul which doesn't take part in the evolutionary process, but still this psychic being which takes part in our <coughs> uh, entire evolutionary process. Like to life, this psychic being birth, it takes birth with us. And now we are at the starting point. Now this is where the guide becomes necessary. Who is our guide? For me and you, Sri Aurobindo and the mother are the guides. He, they are the masters. They are our gurus. We are the shishyas. We are the disciples. And the relation between Sri or we and Sri Aurobindo is nothing different from the relationship between the guru and the shishya of Upanishad time. We are actually living in that period. Those who have Connection with the divine, connection with the master and mother and Sri Aurobindo, we are actually living through those ages of Upanishads and Vedic period. Now here Sri Aurobindo tells us that this journey, dear friends, is not easy. It's not small at all. It's huge. It is huge. And he says, we have the way when, when the distance is very large, we take some breaks here, there, here, there. Now then he says, he identifies for us different planes of consciousness. 
for sure, even though even the mind is a grail of consciousness. So after the ordinary mind, the level, it's because we are all we all belong to the plane of ordinary mental level. We are all ordinary human beings, and then we because the hu the human being has this potential to go forward to take any kind of leap, but it requires preparation. A pole vault jumper cannot just take it. A lot of efforts is needed. A lot of strategy is required. A lot of uh, you know, uh, a perseverance is required. All these things only make sense. So we need a guide who shall sure. We know then he's identified after the ordinary mind. We have what is called higher mind. What is higher mind? After that, we have the illumined mind. Then the intuitive mind. Then the over mind. And then the super mind. The super mind is what we are talking about. Is the supramental consciousness. It is this super, super mind. Then above the super mind is Satchit Ananda. The Satchit Ananda and the super mind belongs to the upper hemisphere as far as your window is concerned. The lower hemisphere comprises of three things Annamaya Loka, Pranamaya Loka, Manamaya Loka. And the fourth Loka here, supporting all the three Lokas, is the Chaitya Loka. So he actually talks about. Four planes in the lower hemisphere, four planes in the upper hemisphere, which actually are the mirror images of those reflections. Now, what is this higher mind? Illumined mind, intuitive mind, over mind. These are the stages we all had to climb. This is the ladder created by Sri Aurobindo for the evolutionary process for the human species. Now when he, he goes into this, what we can, we should remember here very clearly is up to the level of over mind, it is still the mind, the human mind which is capable of higher and higher potentials. I can give you an example. What is the difference between each, when we go from ordinary mind to higher mind, we have higher capabilities, higher features, higher uh, siddhis which, which come to us. Then you go from higher mind to illumined mind. The mode of knowledge gets different. The mode of understanding becomes different. The intuitive mode, similarly. It, it, the best way is to understand is, we all understand. We all understand how many dimensions in our existence now. Three dimensions, four dimensions, if we consider time as the fourth dimension, we consider four dimensions. But are we masters of all the four dimensions? Seeing the first dimension, which is a dot, we are masters of it. Suppose I stand here. I stand here. I'm able to stand here. I know I, if I want to get out, I can get out. But I have the control on that dimension. What is the next two dimensions? Two dimensions is, two dimension is a linear dimension. That is... I have this point, I have the other point, I can go and come and go and come. This is better than the single dimension, right? I have control over this also because I can decide to go, I can decide to come back, I can decide to go and come back. What is the three dimension which has got a much higher capability? I can make the height get, gets included here. So I know I can go, I can fly, I can come down, I can reach any point. This also we have mastered. Then what is the fourth dimension? Fourth dimension is some of the intellectuals, the scientists, like for example, Einstein talk, talking about the time aspect of it. For a particular time, your location is such. So the fourth dimension, we are aware of the fourth dimension, but we are not a master of it because we cannot go back into time. We have not mastered time. We can only we can't even go back into the future. We can, cannot go forward into the future because we have not much time. All we are aware of is there is a dimension called time. That's all. And he says the present. We are never in the present. We are always in the past. We are always in the future because we are never in the present. That, that present is gone now. As I speak, fraction of a second is gone. I don't have the present at all. I am either in the past or in the future. 
Isn't it beautiful? So now we do not understand beyond fourth dimension. But there are people who are talking about the scientists. For example, Stephen Hawking, who we are talking to, we have heard, he talks about 11 dimensions. The science itself identifies 11 dimensions now. Talk about the parallel universes, etc., etc. So we can't even imagine. So even though we all belong to a single human species, there is a difference of understanding, comprehending between the different dimensions. The Vedas and Upanishads, the absolute what we are talking about, he has 64 dimensions. So we cannot even think of understanding. So anyway, let us come back to this. Now, who is now? Why this becomes important for us to understand is again in in the uh, Ikira Upanishad. There is one more reference which I would like to give you. It says, Brahma Vida Noti Param, Tat Esha Abhyukta Satyam Jnanam Anantam Brahma, Yo Veda Nihitam Guhayam Parame Pyoman. That means, that Brahman who is deep within the secret chambers of your heart, if you know that Brahman, then you will know the original Brahman. Yo Veda Nihita Buhaya Parame Yomandani, who stays in the secret heart chamber of your heart. It is there, it comes. So when so that is that becomes so it, Knowing the truth, my true self becomes absolutely important in the initial stages. So this is how the gradations of minds from higher mind to living mind to intuitive mind, as we understand the, 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 the intensity, the flexibility, the character, the, everything varies. When we come to the super, um, when we come to the over mind level, the things completely change. But at over mind also, there is a division. It is not the complete, uh, perfect mental, uh, the, the plane of consciousness also. Even there, there is a division because the origin is still, the, it is connected with the ordinary mind. Now, here, you know, there is, I'm, I'm sure all of us have heard this story of uh, uh, Indra, Vayu and Agni. They're, these are all called the overmental gods. And to when Sri Aurobindo says that there is a difference, why I'm quoting these things is we can actually draw parallels from Vedas and Upanishads uh, into what Sri Aurobindo, because Sri Aurobindo, everything, he, in fact, the, the entire life divine starts with some of the quotes from Vedas and Upanishads only. So, this story. How the division occurs, even the ego occurs at the over mental level, this story indicates uh, that these three gods, Indra, Vayu and Agni, they think that they forget from where they have acquired this power, from where they have got this power. They think that we can do everything, so they forget the, the, the source of their power. You know, you remember I told you the mind of minds, and who is he? He is the mind of minds. He is the eye of eyes. He is the ear of ears. What makes us to hear? He is, it is he. What makes us uh, to see? It is the eye of eye. That's why he, he talks about that. And then these three people forget that source, these three gods, and they want to, Brahma wants to teach him a lesson. So he says, he comes in the form of Yaksha and then he places them, oh, you are so and so, who are you? I am God, Indra. First he calls, in fact, Agni. He says, I am the Agni. I can burn anything in this universe. And then he places one small uh, stick, a blade of grass, is placed, burn this. Agni comes, tries with all his power, cannot burn. He goes back, he says, what is this? I cannot burn. Same thing happens to Vayu. So Vayu also comes and then he says, who are you? I am the God of 
win. I can I force so much of force is there. I can take anything. I can lift anything if I want. So lift this blade of grass. Vayu comes with all his power, but not able to lift it. Goes back. Indra is smart. He comes there. And then he has seen Agni and Vayu failing. So before he comes back, he asks somebody. He says, who is this Yaksha? Who is, which is this form? Which is this form which comes with? And then he is told that he is the source of all your energy. And then Indra doesn't boast of himself. He comes and then prostrates before Brahma. And then he says that he realizes so, among the, in the very Vedas and Upanishads, it is understood why Indra is considered as the supreme god. He is the first god to realize who Brahma is, who the creator is, who the Parabrahma is. Brahma here is the Brahman who is the Parabrahma. So, that is, so it just to indicate that even at the overmental level, this division comes into picture. Ego has a place. When we cross this, so Sri Aurobindo again explains very elaborately in synthesis of yoga in several other places, there might have been many people, many great rishis, seers, who have come up to this level of overmind, because this overmind is an interface between the supermind and the, the lower sphere. And just immediately above the super above the overmind, it's the blazing, uh, dazzling sun, you know, which is the bright light of that supramental. It is there. So probably without even crossing the overmind, you know, they see that light, the dazzling supreme uh, the light, supramental light, and then they mistake it that they have seen the super supermind itself. They have achieved. They have gone there. So they come back. So they have, he cautions that maybe this is possible. So he doesn't, it is not possible. And this is where, again, and mother says, actually, this is the lid. She calls it as a golden lid. One has to remove this golden lid. And if you remember the painting of hammering, you know, that golden lid. So then, this over is possible to get into the supermind, supramental plane, and along with simultaneously the super, supramental consciousness comes down. It's again here the same thing. If you go, if you remember that shloka, Hiranyana Patrena Satya Shyapi Tam Kham Tat Pam Pushana Pavnu Satya Dharmaya Drishtaye. It's once you remove that golden lid, this supramental light comes into the picture. Now, once this, please remember, this is supramental consciousness is not the same as the overmental consciousness. It is a new consciousness. It is a new consciousness. We, we, let us take a little diversion here to understand. We, 29th February 1956, we all know is the descent of supramental light. And we say that it has descended, it is in the Earth's subtle atmosphere. If it has come into the Earth's atmosphere, then why it is not happening? Why something is not happening? Why it is so much of uh, chaos we see all around? There is what is called an explanation of critical mass. In this critical mass, this is biologically also proved and scientifically also is that all monkeys did not become mad at a time, did they? No. When human species came into the existence, there are still monkeys. Even now there are some monkeys. Only a few monkeys, when they acquire certain additional features or additional qualities, they become fit for the next step. Only those few monkeys, let us say, that which we call it as critical mass, automatically there is a mutation which happens and then mutation for a higher species come into picture. So this mutation from of the critical mass 
for a better species, for a higher species, is that is what is important. And probably the supramental light, which is now there in the subtle uh, earth, in the subtle field, subtle domain of the earth, is waiting for that critical mass of the human species, waiting for some of us to take the first step, to be a part of that critical mass where the mutation comes into the picture and the higher species, what Sri Aurobindo talks about, comes into the picture. And that happens where? That doesn't happen anywhere in the heavens. That happens here on earth. And that is why establishing divine life upon earth is the aim of integral yoga. And this is our spiritual journey. This is our, uh, in a sense, is our travel from matter to spirit. I think this is all I can say at this point in time. I think still we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes open for questions and answers. Um, I uh, believe that uh, the information that is already in the physical plane, not just in the science plane, because um, we can experience it and many people are in the science and uh, see that it is already in the physical So we can't, uh, I think at the time we should also look at this. But we have gone a long way right now. And um, many of us do experience um, certain things which are unexplainable. And during the time to where we not not quite the time for no people, the such a time where physical body people are able to stand the level of consciousness, really, because your body is an instrument. So you are able to check how much what the level of consciousness. Super level consciousness in the physical is not in the social media. We are able to stand. We have been doing certain experiments and we are able to see that there is um, each one of us has already everyone, every everything has this already in their physical self. There are a couple of people whom I met who have been quite a lot of space where their body has got a literally like you know the time for the relationship. So I think we can also start looking at it another angle than just thinking that everything is still in the past. Unfortunately, mother is not here to tell us that it is already there. So it is there if you just um, go deeper and see that. Yeah, it's it's good. Uh, at least I am not the one of those lucky ones who, ex who has experience in the supramental. No. no. Yeah, one will automatically become one will automatically. No, but I know where I stand. I, I know where I stand. I I have long, long, many more lives to go. To come to that level, even to understand what supramental is. See that supramental actually the light it, it transforms the whole thing. You will not be in a shape of the human this thing at all. Understanding the science has not reached that level at all. What is the science? What is the experiment you are talking about? What kind of experiment? You are talking about extension of auras. You're you can actually stand. Yeah. Actually stand. Uh, the how much was the level of psychic there? I think two persons. And how much do you realize which part we answer? Like we like that. It's not our. No, no. See, this is this is the this is the irony. On one side, science says we do not believe anything. We do not believe in the spirit. On one side, we want to experiment it. You know? So, but anyway, it's good that ultimately physics and metaphysics has to converge. They are the two facets of the same point. Either even by negation, God has to be found. I mean, yeah, the ultimate truth is one. 
either my belief that god exists must be false or true or the science belief that he exists or he doesn't exist one of the things must be true but what happens is it it the total transformation i i i, I don't know there are lot of people who have attained so many siddhis we have attained what what are 56 to 2000 40 years we are talking about 2000 crores of years 15 to 20 billion years we have reached to this mental ordinary mental level so the supramental whoever i i don't know i uh, because it's in completely individual experience i don't know there may be sri aurobindo or the mother in you but i don't know so one thing is sri aurobindo did not just give the name supramental he experienced it point number 1 he experienced it yes it, it is he he called it as supramental okay and the same thing is there as richit in the veda upanishad rigveda it is talks about richit which is something of it and in rigveda if you take it is only those saptashis who have got supramental life so whether the earth is still ready for this supramental and then uh, uh, maybe it has started its trickling effect has already been started which uh, we don't know i at least i don't know. but this is a difference what should be the caution here is that's why i told you that story that shorbin do very categorically cautions this do not mistake the overmental gods their energy their strength to be the supramental light because the force of supramental consciousness super mind is completely different so i don't know <laughs> yeah there is what is called logic of the finite and logic of the infinite okay so logic of the finite is our logic the way i understand the consciousness the way i understand purusha why purusha is different from prakriti why prakriti is different from purusha why god is considered as he why not she all these things are which arise from the logic of the finite now there is a logic of the infinite no logic of the finite cannot be understood cannot understand the logic of the infinite logic of the finite is where all the dualities exist what we are talking about but in the logic of the infinite there is no duality at all there is no he she there is no uh, good and bad there is no light and darkness there is no knowledge and ignorance everything is like a dimmer stat if there is a light and then there is a dimmer stat if you slowly off that light the light intensity goes down and then at a point light goes off now is the light there or it light is not there the light is involved in darkness when you reverse the whole thing the darkness gets involved in the light now here coming back to the thing it is the vedas and i mean the the, the ancient hindu scriptures the sanatana dharma use so much of importance to aditi she is the mother of all gods she is the creation so it is just a purusha and prakriti purusha is the immutable witness the entire creation is done by prakriti the prakriti is the female aspect of purusha prakriti purusha and prakriti ardha narishwara both are responsible for the entire creation it is this 
the female and feminine aspects of that one existence, one entity. That's why we call Shurabindo and the mother. What do you call that? It is double fold avatar, as uh, you know, uh, what is his name? They are called as double fold avatar because we don't know whether the next avatar comes in one form or two form or multiple forms. Or, we don't know that. But there is no equal importance is given to uh, Prakriti and Purusha both. Yeah, it, it is that. I am that. I am this. See, the executive force then and now also is the feminine force. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, let me come to the first uh, part of your question that is, what is involution and what is evolution? Evolution, of course, evolution is from matter to now what we have come. And uh, involution is a step which precedes, is a process which precedes evolution. Now, involution is in the process of creation. Uh, if you, in, in Savitri, it starts, it was the other before God's awake. It it's actually starts from there. And once the Leela starts, how does this whole thing happen? So there has to be a play field. Now let us say if it is a play, if I draw analogy between the creation and let us say universe as a play field. For a for a play to happen, there has to be a play field and there has to be a set rules, regulations, the boundaries, everything marked. So what does this creation happen in the process of creation? Whoever has created the Supreme, he has got down from the summit of his consciousness to the level of matter. So he comes down in several steps by creating different planes of consciousness. He comes to the matter and then by the time the Supreme Consciousness comes down to the level of matter, it forgets itself. It dilutes itself. And when it dilutes itself, there is a kind of a SOS call which happens. And then this consciousness, because it is aware of itself also, and it can act on itself also, then starts pulsating and from there the evolution uh, starts. But this involution process is actually a kind of, if, if you read uh, Light Divine, there is an analogy, Sri Aurobindo views an analogy for as a parallel stage. You know, for this to happen, this game to happen, there is, he creates, the God creates the down stage, downward stage. So each step he is referred to as a plane of Consciousness is a word by itself. And there is a parallel step. When this downward state is created, there is a parallel state which is created. Now, this God, the, 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 the essence of the, this game is, is how the from matter, it should climb back those same steps and states. Parallel to that, what is created. And that is the play of evolution and reaches the same top. So now this, unless something comes down, nothing can go up. And that is how Sri Aurobindo says, unless something is involved, something cannot evolve. What is that which is involved, which has come from that consciousness, which has come from the top, which has come from the top means there is a process. How can an infinite, we keep on saying that it is that infinite consciousness. How does that infinite consciousness come into the picture? How infinity can come into finite? Suppose in terms of mathematics, if you want to talk, how infinite can become a finite aspect? Purnamada, Purnamidam, Purnamada. You cannot divide it at all. So, whether now how can the infinite becomes finite? So this there is a process. That process probably I and you are not aware, but the, there is one person who, aware, who is aware of that. And that is how the 
the, the, the creative medium or the matrix of super mind gets created. And from super mind, the over mind. Now we talked about the reverse process, but in the creation, the evolution process, it is such it ananda, then the super mind gets created from the super mind where the oneness exists. And then when it comes to the overweight level, then the division starts. At the supermind level, division also exists, the oneness also exists. You know, the eternal unity of the one, the, of the many and the, uh, you know, there's a beautiful sentence. I, I forget, I forget that. So it is ultimately that unity and diversity both are there. So when it comes down, then it comes down to the intuitive mind, even different levels, and then we come to the lower level. So this whole coming down is an involution process. And in fact, there is a devolution process also. And people talks about three processes, involution, devolution, and then the evolution process. Devolution is that process where the consciousness in the matter is still sleeping for some time. Huh? happens, you know, it, it's still waiting, it's, it is not reached, you know, that period and if you equate it to, let us say 15 to 20 billions of years of creation of the universe of the Big Bang thing it, it is some of that period where all this churning happens and uh, the life when, it, when the first uh, a single cell uh, amoeba or uh, prokaryote comes into the picture. Up to there, it is actually the evolution period. And then the evolution period, because even in our Dashavatara, the evolution starts only from Matsyavatara. Isn't it? The first avatara is Matsya only, Matsyavatara only. So till that time, probably it is a period of evolution. So um, MP Pandit's book, it, it very beautifully explains this. And your second question, as far as the consciousness and then uh, quantum physics is there, uh, I think it's a very vast subject where uh, many people have dealt with. In fact, I had mentioned it to you also, the Darcy Woolley Masters by Gary Zuko. He's one of the Nobel laureate physicists who talks about the Darcy Woolley Masters in Chinese language in the subatomic particles. The subatomic particles, how they dance. If you are habituated to read Fridge of Kappa, the Tao of Physics, the web, um, web Connections, and all these books which talk about the subatomic particles, how they behave, and in what is quantum mechanics. Is ultimately, everything we are talking about at the subatomic level, the energy package. So every force gets in, resolved itself into of energy, in one kind of energy, and energy cannot be uh, either created or destroyed, it only has to be transformed, isn't it? I've forgotten all my physics and uh, this thing, but that's what Sri Aurobindo also talks about in Life Divine. So th this becomes an absolutely, consciousness is still a field of experiment, now, all these years we were talking about the universe made up of 97% matter. And now we are suddenly talking about 97% of the universe is made up of antimatter. We still don't know what is happening. We keep saying that Big Bang, whether it happened or not, but still we consider the most costliest, most expensive laboratory today in the world is built by those people who don't believe the existence of God, but they want to understand how the creation of the universe has happened. This is the Large Hadron Collider LHC, which is in the foothills of the Alps. So much of experiment, how the Big Bang happens, how the, what kind of, uh, and this mother, see, the, the beauty is that when the whole creation happened, before, when the Big Bang took place, Within 10 to the power of minus 37 seconds, the four fundamental forces separate. What are those four fundamental forces? The electrical, electromagnetic force, the gravitational force, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. These are the four 
universal forces even today that govern the universe. And if you go back and then see, Mother talks about four forces immediately coming into the picture in a new tipping off may happen any any moment. In, in agenda, um, Satyam says that it takes about three hundred years still we have to wait. So uh, we we are all at that level. Three hundred years or four hundred years or five hundred years in the universal scale is nothing. Is nothing, and probably I and you would have come back because I'm sure we'll come back to the mother's speech. That because mother has assured us. Right. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.